Good morning to everybody. I uh, try to respect my time, and uh, so I will read my speech. But uh, uh, there are a lot of points I have uh, to uh, track to in uh, my paper. So if uh, you want uh, to deep uh, to do to go too deep, uh, you can read uh, my paper. So the title of my speech is "The Gift of Life." the new challenges of the transition to parenthood. And talking about the gift of life implies, first of all, affirming that what is given is what we have not constructed, and for these reasons is out of our control. Accepting life as a gift is not the same thing as manufacturing a product. The product is manufacturing outside ourselves according to a logic of control, that allows to make a product without defect. A child, on the other end, is hosted inside the mother's body, which is deformed to make room for him, her, and which is not in a logic of control, but in a logic of trust. Moreover, the one who generates give birth, gives life, but is in turn a child who has received it as a gift from his or her parents. Born, therefore, becomes part of an exchange between giving, receiving, returning that characterizes the family bond, overcoming the, logic, the economic logic of social exchange, considered as a search for a balance between cost and benefit, and introducing the idea that the gift is always a surplus and uh, it is this, uh, at the same time a debt that is shared by all generations, parents and children, who have received and uh, who have indirectly give life back by generating in turn. This dynamic appears a central characteristic of the human condition. In the gift debit polarity, we can find the original co-presence of the affective quality and the ethical quality, the matris munus and the patris munus, that is, the maternal gift and the paternal gift that uh, are at the origin of the human being. The gift, in fact, is a characteristic of family bond that is at its origin free, trustful, and affective in nature. When this element of gratuitousness is absent, there is a relational pathology in which people are incapable of affection and uh, the other is used and exploited. But the gift coexists also with the other side of the coin, that is the debt and obligation, the ethical urgency to give back what has been received. Gratuitousness is a gift without a deadline, but not without expectation from the ethical point of view. In a longer multi-generational perspective, these components of trustful gift and owing debt are strongly interconnected, especially in the exchange between generations that accompanies a new birth. The role play that rigidly attributes to parents the component of the gift and to children the component of the debt is therefore false or, or at least partial. As we have said, in fact, the parents, uh, being themselves children, have also received life as a gift. Thus, parents and children share both the gift and the debt. We have to say that in healthy family, in anti-families, people reciprocate not only for a moral obligation, but because they are moved by the desire to give back. In these cases, one identifies with the source of the gift and is driven to give in turn. The symbolic exchange typical of family relationships consists in giving to the other what he, she needs. It is moved by the trust that the other will reciprocate with a similar coin when he, she can. One does not necessarily reap the fruits of what he, she 
as shown during one's lifetime. Rather, restitution occurs over generations. In order to capture the depth of family ties, one must be able to go beyond the present and one's own life. This is the meaning of life as a gift. However, this conception of life as a gift appears to be challenged by today's culture. Today, rather than considering the child as a gift, we consider the child as a choice or as a right, and we forget the intergenerational scope of generativity, adopting an individual perspective limited to the here and now. Such a perspective reflects only the position of the present generation, the choice or the right of parents, and does not consider the intergenerational chain <clears throat> in which the free gift received from previous generations is inserted, calling for taking responsibility for subsequent generations. Today, people choose whether, when, and how having a child. And this, although advantages from the point of view of the responsibility that accompanies the choice as opposed to the fatalism that accompanies destiny, also brings with it a series of critical consequences, which we can observe, for example, at the demographic level, as uh, we have seen um, uh, with the, the month's speech. Mm? The the, um, this aspect has certainly contributed, at least in Italy, but uh, in, uh, all, in all the world, to the phenomenon of the progressive and unstoppable decline in birth, to the raising of the age of primi pares, and the consequent spread of the family model of the single child. People have children only when they believe there are all, there are all the conditions to grow them, and only when they desire to have a children. The other dominant trend, which in turn derives from this idea of the child as a choice, is the increasing social acceptance of the conception of the child as a right, or the right to parenthood. In this perspective, parenthood is no longer regarded as the adult's possibility or willingness to accept a child as a gift, but as an option subject only to adult desire or claim to such an extent that the impossibility of procreation is not tolerated and people are willing to use any means to realize their desire. In order to understand the challenges that these conceptions of parenthood imply from, from a psychological, educational and social point of view, it is necessary, <clears throat> first of all, to develop a reflection on the meaning of being a child and, therefore, conversely, on the meaning of being a parent. In other words, we need to move from a descript descriptive level of the roles and function of the parents and children in the family to a reflection on parental and filial identity that starts from the existential question of who is a child. Those intercepting a question that concerns all of us, since uh, the condition of the child is a human condition that is common to all of us. And we could briefly say that the person, every person, is originally a child, a generated. But what, what does it mean? It, it, it means to be a child. What are the characteristics of filial identity? We can affirm that filial identity implies different dim dimensions of the human being. First of all, in the experience, experience of filiation, there is uh, the biological dimension, represented by being generated and traceable through the concrete sign of physical resemblance, the inheritance of genetic traits. In other words, being a children is a mother of body. The second dimension deals with the caregiving educational domain. The survival and growth of the child depend on maternal care and protection, 
on the one hand, and on paternal norms, sense of limits, and emancipatory drives on the other. Being a child is therefore a mother of care and education. A third component is what we might call the intergenerational dimension, which has to do with the family history of the child, the ties with parental networks, the transmission of family values, and allows the child to develop a sense of belonging, a belonging to lineage by the encounter between two lineages, the maternal and parent paternal ones. In other words, being a child is a matter of lineages. Finally, being a child, children also has a social dimension. In fact, the child is not only the biological and educational product of a couple or a family lineage, but is a person who is given to the world, that is, made available to the world and to the social reality in which he or she is inserted, uh, from an ethnical, social, economic point of view. Yet, being a child is also a matter of society and culture. We could therefore say that the objective of those who generate is the protection of being children to all intents and purposes, that is, the protection of a condition of identity constitutive of and common to all human being, beings, which presupposes the presence of the different dimensions mentioned above. When a, one or more of these dimensions is missing, the person runs the risk of not being able to fully realize his or her identity, which is constitutive of his or her very existence. It could be said that one does not exist except that as a child, as a generated person. For this reason, the social context takes charge and tries to compensate for, for any shortcomings in one or more of these dimensions, for example, with tools for protection and defense, uh, such as adoption or foster care, implicitly recognizing that the value of the anthropological category of the child as generated by, by a father and mother within an intergenerational and social history. The coexistence of these uh, four dimensions, which defines the deepest identity of being a child, must be guaranteed throughout the life path through the different transition that parent-child relationships go through. These dimensions can be transformed into concrete choices and behaviors in different ways, but the fundamental aspects will remain inalienable. If we reflect on the current tendency to conceive the child as a choice and as a right, we can understand the consequences that derive from such a conception from the point of view of the parent's duty to protect the filial identity and the complexity of the needs of each child as a person. For example, the child considered as a mere choice challenges, above all, the dimension of caregiving and education. Let's see in which way. The decrease in the number of births and its character of a chosen and strongly desired event means that birth takes on the characteristics of high emo emotional concentration. Parents end up investing too much in the few children they bring into the world. By considering parenthood as a mere choice, they need their child to conform not only to the image of desired child, but, al but also to conform their own parental identity. The child is at the center, but is often experienced as uh, an extension of themselves, as confirmation of their own parenthood, and not as a unique, uh, irrepeatable, irrepe and uh, reducibly other person with aspect of a mystery and unexpected, uh, typical of the gift, uh, and not of the voluntary choice. The current representation of childhood, therefore, sees the child as the sovereign or idol of the family, 
If such a conception may lead to a new sensitivity toward the child, it can also become a problem for the children because they feel they have to respond to high expectations and the challenges self-image through which they unconsciously embody the need for realization of the parents, from which it will be more difficult to detach themselves. See the phenomenon of the so-called long family. Young adult children never leave home, and not only for the economic problems. And uh, which will also have consequences at the level of the educational style practice, which often risks to be, aim to be aimed more at seducing seducere, to please the child, to saturate and prevent his or every need, rather than oriented to task the task of the educating ex ducere. In this regard, we speak of narcissistic pure centrism. If the child has a choice, merely affects the dimension of caregiving and education, the child has a right, and especially its a direct consequence of the search for the child at all costs, with the use of heterologous medically assisted procreation techniques, threatens instead the other dimension of filiation, namely the biological, intergenerational, and social dimension. In other words, the right to parent to that all cost threatens the right of the child to have access to its origins and to fully develop its filial identity. In fact, MAP techniques, especially heterologous ones, presuppose the inclusion of a third party within the parental couple of origin. And the issue is not insignificant from the point of view of the identity-related topic of the origin. We have to say, on the other end, that the increasingly frequent use of various medically-assisted procreation techniques in order to have a child has, in some cases, also a positive side, because it allows, allows us to deal with the phenomenon of infertility with greater chances of success. But it also has many negative implications when the child is sought at all costs. With respect to procreation, we have moved from a situation of powerlessness and suffered destiny to a situation of control and defiance of destiny. Reproductive technologies push, in fact, to go beyond the limit that has always attracted humanity, with the risk of colluding with the omnipotent economy of the unconscious and its procreative desire. It is impossible, therefore, with regard to this issue, to avoid the ethical component. The desire is such only if combined with responsibility towards themselves and others. Otherwise, it is configured as a form of arbitrariness. From the 70s, the phenomenon of medically assisted procreation has spread exponentially for different reasons. For the increase in infertility, for the right to parenthood claimed by homosexual couples, and for the emergence of uh, an economic business uh, of medical clinics and banks for the donation of gay meat used by both homosexual and heterosexual couples. There are many interventions available among which uh, we have to distinguish homologous reproductive techniques uh, from the heterologous reproductive techniques. In particular, the practice of surrogacy uh, that, that is uh, even more radical because it involves a financial contract with a woman who agrees to carry a pregnancy to term on commission. Beyond the many problematic aspects that affect the relationship of the couple and especially the position of the woman that are not the subject of this reflection, I would like to bring attention above all to the challenges for the children of MAP. A fundamental problem concerns the couple's choice or whether or not the, to reveal to the child the truth about the story of his or her conception. Considerable aspect, especially on the sense of continuity in one's identity. At this regard, 
a special attention should be paid to those cases in which the couple makes use of a, an external donor, which is a necessity for the homosexual couples, and sometimes also an option for sterile uh, heterosexual couple. In these cases, the biological, intergenerational, and social dimension of the affiliation are threatened by the secrecy on the donor's identity and or by the impossibility to trace one's own origin to which the child is condemned. Such a threat uh, has well-known negative consequences as highlighted by research on adopted children. But let's go a bit deeper into, into this topic. In the available research on this issue, the issue of the origin is confined to the topic of parent sincerity or secrecy on the type of conception, the child's willingness to know the identity of the donor, and the frequency and type of contacts with him or her. Unlike the past, nowadays the need for revealing the truth to the children born from donation is widely recognized so that many countries in Europe and around the world provided the legal protection to the right of knowing the identity of the donor. However, it is still possible for the couple to choose an anonymous donor. This choice is certainly less problematic for parents, as it removes uh, the problems related to the involvement of the donor in family dynamics and to possible legal issue, issues uh, about the custody of the child, especially if uh, a separation occurs. In this case, there is a potential conflict between the right of the couple and the right of the child to know his or her origins, and that it is a legal problem. But from a psychological point of view, research has shown that the child's need for knowing is not only a matter of curiosity, but also a search for meaning about the child's own history and an intense need to re-establish a bond with the parent who gave them life. In these children's accounts, we often find a search for physical similarity with the donor, his or her temperament and interest, as well as his or her family history and genetic inheritance, for example, in terms of potential health problems. On a symbolic level, the genetic link immediately activates the genealogical dimension, that is, the connection with previous generations. This, moreover, is the inherently human characteristics of the procreative act in which the biological and mental level are inextricably linked. In this regard, the clinical and research tradition of adoption studies can provide a useful insight on this issue. Yes, thank you. Indeed, today's research and clinical intervention on adoptive families have shown that the origin of uh, the adoptive uh, child need to be preserved rather than cancelled, and that the birth family occupies a mean meaningful place in the mind and the heart of the adopted children throughout their lives. In adoption, the birth parent never disappears. His or her absence always generates suffering to the point that adopted children often decide to return in their country of origin in case of international adoption and search for their family members, birth parents, and siblings. Adoption professionals know very well that this is a long and painful process that requires constant support. Those children search for their identity. Who am I? Who do I look like? Where do I come from? What are my origins? Cannot be reduced to a matter of open and sincere communication because it has much deeper meaning. Knowing the truth per se does not resolve the search for meaning. What about children of donation then? They definitely share numerous similarities with adopted children. For example, the fact that, that, that they have limited or no access to their, to their birth parents, their past and therefore their origins, but also specific elements of complexity. Consider, in fact, how the position of the adoptive couple and that of the couple who use heterologous MAP are very different. 
in the first case, adoptive parents help the child to elaborate a traumatic origin for which he or she is not responsible. In the second case, the parents willingly choose to give birth to a child with a wounded origin, because partly unknown, a choice they will be held responsible for. Therefore, some fundamental questions arise. Can we reduce the search for meaning of uh, one's origins to the search for the donor's identity? Even when he or she has a name or, or face, who does the person who finds him or her actually meet? A father or mother, or a person who provided their sperm or their egg? Can we avoid talking about the origins? Can we reduce the question of filiation to the affective quality of the parent-child relationship without considering the relevance, re relevance of the transmission of genetic and symbolic heritage that, that passes between generations? And can we consider the psychological risk of choosing to give birth to a new human being at the cost of silencing, silencing his or her genealogical and cultural history? Again, the need for reflecting on what it means to generate and to be generated is even more urgent. Generating does not mean to give birth to a child, an infant, but to a son or daughter, we, uh, what we can call a generated being. The child cannot acquire a complete identity unless he or she is included into a generational and social relationship. From this point of view, being a son, a daughter, can be considered a right, certainly not being a parent. If anything, parenthood is configured and as an ethical duty rather than a right, holding parents to respect and recognize the right of their own children to be sons and daughters. Generating, therefore, brings to the forefront the theme of the origin that necessarily involves the couples but goes beyond it and its desire. Uh, can I use uh, two minutes? OK, again. The issue we, has, uh, we have just addressed, and in particular the theme, the theme of biotechnologies applied to reproduction, open up an issue I'd like to raise in concluding my talk. Is the child a product, the outcome of reproductive process, or is uh, he, she a uh, new? human generation, the outcome of generative process. The question is, first of all, anthropological, and urges us to reflect on our understanding of the human being, understood as an object or as a person. An object is produ produced, a person is generated. The production-reproduction pair is typical of the world of objects as an animal, and evokes the idea of the product, a photocopy, we, uh, could say, of mass production. The purpose of a reproduction in the animal world is, in fact, the continuity of the species and uh, its survival. The little one of the animal world is one of the serious anonymous impersonal. And what about uh, human, human generation? Human generation itself is un in the underpinned to the biblical mandate to continue the human species, but that mandate as peculiar characteristic. Generation pro the generation process has some degree of freedom that can be used for good or evil. The human child born from the encounter between a male and female does more than simply continuing this human species. It renovates. He or she is in fact unique and not replaceable. No son daughter is replaceable with, with another. The human child is a generated one, bound not temporarily, but forever to its generator, who recognize him or her uh, and are recognized by him or her. Recognition is an essential process for the human species. And I can conclude with uh, a little uh, reflection on the concept of generativity, because generativity, not only reproduction, is therefore the fundamental human code, the fulfillment and the deepest realization of the person. Thank you very much.